We've been here for about now two weeks. Uh, still here up to 9th of <coughs> November. So today, yeah, uh, I was set for a public lecture so that you can talk about machine learning mm -hmm. here. Yeah, yeah, machine learning uh, in astronomy. Um, fortunately, the audience uh, were expecting a lot, but I think maybe we had the uh, communication was quite short notice, maybe to others. So we hope in the second uh, series of uh, these public lectures, we may have uh, a bigger audience. So, Priya, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Sol, and thanks so much for having me here. I'm thoroughly enjoying my uh, session over here. One sec, I'll just uh, I'll just adjust it. I'm trying to I'm trying to do this. Uh, let's see if we can manage the thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'll be today talking about something which I've not covered in the the two workshops that we've had. And that is basically about machine learning and astronomy. And that's basically because this is what we've been working for for the past three, four years uh, with a group over here. You can see uh, um, uh, these are three of our students, Mahmood, Mudassir, and Seth. And uh, Hassan, we've been all working together on this machine learning aspect. And um, <clears throat> that's what I'll be talking about. So before that, I'll give you a brief idea of why do we need machine learning and astronomy. That's basically because astronomy earlier, like if you remember the joke that Hassan told you about sheep in Scotland, right, uh, where an astronomer, a statistician and a <coughs> physicist are walking together and they see a white sheep in Scotland. And immediately the, the astronomer screams out and says, oh, all sheep in Scotland are white. Okay, and that's because the joke is basically that astronomers based on small samples. You just saw one sheep in Scotland, and on the basis of that, you declared that all sheep in Scotland are white, right? While, um, so that was a time when astronomy was basically very data poor. We had very little data, so you just had a few, few objects, and based on that, astronomers had to actually make comments, right? That all stars which are blue, they are, you know, of a certain kind, etc. cetera. And, uh, but, but now what happens is, in, in astronomy, we have a lot of data rich science. It has now become from a data poor science to what is called a data rich science. And that's basically because in the 1980s, we had data in the form of megabytes. By 90s, we went to gigabytes. In 2000, we have uh, already in terabytes. And then by 2010, there were petabytes and etabytes, right? So now uh, the, the, the era which we are moving to is the large synoptic sky survey as well as the square kilometer array. And in both these, you can see that the amount of data which is going to be available, it's already available also, is really very large. And therefore, with such complex um, large data sets, it all becomes very different in the sense that we now need to learn some of these sophisticated statistical techniques as well as machine learning because that can help us handle such data. I would also give something very important is that earlier, the kind of science we did was what was called hypothesis driven science. For example, you looked at an object and you built up some kind of a hypothesis of what kind of an object it is. You know, you have your theory. And then based on that theory, you do an experiment that would be in, in physics, but for example, in astronomy, you basically do some observations based on your theory. So you do some observations, which we call the experiment. You did some data analysis of your observations or your experiment, and then you get some understanding depending upon whether your theory satisfies the observations which you get. And in case it does not satisfy, then you readjust your theory so that it, adjust, it, it satisfies the observations. So this is what we call hypothesis driven science, which is the kind of science which is originally done. All of us have been doing that kind of a science where we loop through this method. You have your theory, you have your observations, you have your data analysis, your results. And then based on that, you readjust the theory and you again observe, right? But now in today's times, when we have this data driven science, now we can do science in a different way. In this way, what happens is you start off with a very large data set. Okay, you have a very large data set. Supposing I'm studying the sample of students in CBU, right? I may have a theory about them, which is this one. But here now I have a data set. I have a very large data set of the students over here. 
I check their ages, their genders, their branches, which subjects they are studying, etc. And then I may even study after university, what is it that they do? What are their placements, etc. And based on that, I actually look for patterns, right? I look for patterns that the majority of the students, they are supposing taking engineering or they're taking some other branches, right? And I, I look for patterns within the data which I've collected. For example, supposing if I have more female students in a particular department, right? Maybe you have more female students in the chemistry department and you have lesser female students, supposing in the mathematics department, which is typical, right? So based on that, after I've used my data, then I develop a theory, right? Then I develop a theory that, okay, it is that female students prefer so-and-so subjects, right? I may look for a theory as to, is that the reason, uh, why do they take it up? Is it because of the kind of jobs which they will get after, uh, you know, passing out from a particular department, etc. So that will be my theory, okay, which I have built up based on the data I collected, okay? And then I may analyze my data in the light of this theory, and then I may get a better understanding. If I want to have a good understanding is what do students basically want, right? What are students looking for? What are the streams they want? Uh, how do they assess streams based on um, their, uh, you know, their options in uh, future in terms of placements, in terms of whatever? And based on that, I can get an understanding. So both these methods are actually complementary methods. There's no argument about which method is the correct method. But this is the kind of method which we can now do. That's basically because we have so much of data, right? Earlier when we did not have that kind of data, we didn't have a choice. We only had to do hypothesis driven. But now we can do data driven science where we can actually say that data speaks, right? Data tells us what is happening, right? So that's the basic concept. So like I said, because you have huge amount of astronomical data, it's beyond human capacity. We have already gone through, for example, if you're doing Kepler data analysis, you know in Kepler data, you have a million stars. If you have a million stars, you cannot be drawing light curves like that for a million stars, right? You have definitely have to, you can have your Python notebooks, but then there is some point at which there's human intervention. So you need to therefore train your computers what, if you remember when we did the Kepler data, we did it that you have to basically inspect the data and based on that, you uh, complete the analysis. But now if you cannot be doing that for a million stars, what you do is you train your computer to actually sift through the data and identify patterns, find connections and do it. And that's the process which is called machine learning, where you actually let it to a machine to actually do based on the training you provided. Right. So they are basically it started off with artificial intelligence, which was in the 50s and the 80s. Then you had between the 80s and the 2010s, you had the development of machine learning. And after that, you have deep learning. Right. So uh, what we are basically dealing with is machine learning, deep learning, uh, not with the AI part. Right. Because that's that's the bigger. These are subsets of that. OK, now, what are the types of machine learning? We are typically going to be using three types of machine learning. Rather, we are going to use two types. One is what is called supervised, and one is unsupervised, and one is reinforcement. What is supervised learning? Supervised learning is, for example, <clears throat> you show the machine uh, 100 pictures of dogs. Okay? And then, so you train the system. You give it some data. You say, oh, this is what dogs look like, okay? So then if you show it another picture, it can identify and tell you whether it's a dog or it's a cat, right? Because you have trained it saying, this is what dogs look like, this is what cats look like, and therefore it can predict it. So that is what is called supervised learning, for which you need to have a training set, right? So if my job is to identify dogs, I need to have these uh, sample images of dogs, which I can use to train my system. The other way is unsupervised. Is supposing you do not have such samples, then you do unsupervised. And reinforcement is kind of a combination of them where the system then learns from the mistakes. So you, you actually start off and then you do it. But we are going to basically deal with supervised and unsupervised. So what are supervised uh, learning algorithms used for? They are basically used for two purposes. For example, classification, like I told you the example of dogs and not dogs. 
So you're showing them images and you identify whether the image is a dog or not dog, right? So that is what is called classification. And you could also have it for regression. Supposing you are using it to predict some, uh, so in classification, basically your object is either dog, not dog, right? There are only two options, they're binary options. But for example, in regression methods, you, for example, you're using some method to predict, for example, the age of a star or the redshift of a quasar or something like that. Then you are using a regression method where you train the system and you have the redshift of some objects or you, if it is supervised, you have the redshift of some objects and you use that to predict the redshift of unknown objects, right? So that is the regression method. Okay. Okay. So for example, there is a very uh, well-known uh, citizen science project, which is called Galaxy Zoo. Okay. Now, like I mentioned earlier, also, there's something called citizen science. That is, there are many people who are not trained astronomers, but would still like to do astronomy and do astronomy at a slightly serious level in the sense they uh, they are uh, they can dedicate say 2 hours per day to doing astronomy right so there are various citizen science projects i can let you know more about it at another time but this is an example of one of the citizen science projects so this is called galaxy zoo and basically what happens is that now because of various surveys of the hubble and now even james webb you have a large amount of images so you can see these are various images of galaxies. Now, typically when you look at a galaxy image, it is very easy for us to say, I can say, yeah, this is a spiral. This one is an elliptical. This one is, an, you know, you have irregular galaxies. You have all kinds. So we human beings can immediately look at it and can uh, identify, right? So this one actually has tutorials where if you don't know what a spiral galaxy looks like, it will actually show you examples of spiral galaxies. So that you know that, okay, this is what a spiral galaxy looks like. This is what a barred galaxy looks like. This is what an elliptical galaxy looks like. And so what the citizen scientists do is you do, you classify the morphology for say a thousand galaxies. And I don't remember, but if you do a certain amount of galaxies, you get a certificate from Galaxy Zoo. And they use this as their training samples, because now they have samples of millions of galaxies. They have to study their galaxy. So exactly like I gave you the dog, no dog example, in this case, you have citizen scientists who are giving the morphology of various galaxies and you have many people, so you compare. So supposing if one person wrongly identifies a spiral galaxy, that's okay because the same galaxy is being identified by say 20 different people. So you pick up the one which is most often, you use that as your training set and you can use that to, to classify the remaining galaxies. So I don't have a copy over here, but the Galaxy Zoo pro, uh, project even led to many publications on morphologies of galaxies based on the classification done by non-astronomers, the citizen science project people. Similarly, variable stars. We did Kepler data, but I, I did not tell you that if you have essentially Kepler data is giving you variable stars. So what do you mean? You have a light curve and the light curve is changing in a certain way. And typical stars, you can see these are called Ara Lyrae stars. These are pulsating stars. These are what are called del delta scooties. These ones are elliptic, uh, eclipsing binaries, which look similar to exoplanets. There are long period variables. There are various variables. And you can see that these variable stars, the light curves, have different shapes depending upon the kind of variable star it is. And therefore, even machine learning techniques are used to inspect light curves of variable stars and classify them. Okay, so this is a classification problem where you classify them using the signature light curves. So for example, even when people are looking for Kepler data, this is exoplanet discoveries using the transit method, what you actually do is they actually look for, uh, oh, sorry, I, yeah. They actually look for various uh, light curves and classify whether they are exoplanets or whether they, they are the variable stars. Because in Kepler data, you will get variable stars mixed with exoplanets. So if you want to identify the exoplanets, you can do that from the variable stars. Even other people do it, for example, if you have the redshift of galaxies, I have a sample of galaxies, and you have some of them for which you have the redshift. Some of them you just have the spectrum. So the spectrum you can see on the upper right. You can use the spectrum to find the redshift of the galaxies. 
And instead of doing it manually, you actually do it via machine learning techniques. There's also an interesting example of the three-body problem. The three-body problem is a problem which is chaotic and highly unpredictable. And through um, numerical methods, people were always unable to solve it. Rather, it's, it's been proven that you cannot solve it. So what happened is in MIT, a group of people actually used machine learning techniques. They actually used a, the three-body problem. There's no analytical solution, OK? So what they basically did is they, uh, let me uh, try to get back to that slide so that you can see the nice animation. So what they did is they used three-body data for some known systems, for a large number of known systems, and used that to actually solve the um, three-body problem through a machine learning method, right? Because you know you cannot do it analytically, so the other method was to do it with this method. Please, why does it not want to do it? Okay, but you saw, so, the, so they actually did that. Okay, yeah. So you can see that using machine learning techniques, otherwise the people solve it using numerical techniques because you cannot do it analytically. It's proved that you cannot do it. So there's no sense trying. Okay, I hope you've all seen this image, which is the image of the Event Horizon Telescope, right? The, the Black Hole Telescope. And not many people are aware that actually deep learning algorithms were used to get this image, okay? So what was done is, in this image, it was basically looking at M87 and looking at the, uh, the supermassive black hole in the center of the galaxy. And to reconstruct the image, right, to get this image, which was the most famous image, I think, of the year 2020 or 2021. It was the most popular image uh, that was there. This is, of the, this is a consortium of various telescopes put together to actually give you the resolution required to look at the black hole in the center of M87. So this was a very uh, well known this thing, but this one also used machine learning techniques. Okay, so now I'm going to come to a special technique with the one that we applied. Those were the, that was the general background of machine learning. We used it to an area which is close to our heart, which is star clusters. So how did we use it in this method? So I've already spoken to you about this, that stars basically are born in groups, which are called star clusters. And the, the group is formed from the same molecular cloud. And because they are formed from the same molecular cloud, they have the same age, the same distance, the same chemical composition, and the same velocities, right? And they could be of various kinds. For example, you could have, these are called open clusters. So for example, the Pleiades, which is in the constellation Taurus, you can actually see it. This is not that, but you can actually see the Pleiades. And this is a typical globular cluster where you have uh, stars at a much uh, closer distance. They are more compactly um, uh, placed. But what is important about this is that these stars are all formed at the same time, the same distance, the same chemical composition. They only differ in their mass. Okay. So they, the, one of the experiments we did over here was about building an HR diagram for these stars. You can do them and it's the ideal way to study the HR diagram because you have a sample of stars formed from the same molecular cloud and uh, uh, they only differ in mass. So you can see how does mass affect their evolution. Now what we basically do it is we use data of this European Space Agency satellite, which is called Gaia. And Gaia is basically two identical three meter, these are two mirrors over there at an angle of 106.5 degrees. They give you an accuracy of 20 microseconds, arc seconds at 42 kpc. I have not put that thing, okay? But I think we did that earlier that 24 micro arc seconds is like looking at a Bohr atom, the Bohr, the first Bohr radius at a distance of one kilometer. Okay, so if you can identify that, it's that um, accurate in its this. And this basic purpose of this um, mission is basically to study what we call galactic archaeology. Now, archaeology, we know, is the studying of the history, the origins, right? And basically, that's exactly what it wants to do, is that what it does is that for a billion stars in our galaxy, it measures accurately their positions. And because it does their positions, it finds the change in position, which gives you the parallax, because one upon the parallax of the distance. And then it also gives you their proper motions, their velocities in right ascension and declination as well as it also does radial velocity measurements, which gives you the velocity in your line of sight. 
So what it's basically giving you is it's giving you a perfect 3D model of the galaxy. Okay. And uh, we basically use this model to study the galaxy and study its origins. But we are now applying this for star clusters. So for example, this is a sample image of a star cluster. Right now, the important question in this image is that which are the stars which actually belong to this cluster? You can see there are some red stars, there are some blue stars, there are some uh, fainter stars, the whiter ones. And the, the idea is how do you identify which ones belong? Right now, uh, Gaia gives us the data, and the data is in forms of uh, right ascension, declination, proper motions, parallax, etc. So what we did is the first method we applied was we applied a supervised learning method that is, but the problem is this in this you need good training data right, for example, when I gave you the example of the dogs, the 100 dog images which you provide to the cell computer, you should be sure that they are dogs right, if you make a mistake in your training data, then obviously the computer will not give you good results, so you need to have good training data, and if you have good training data, then obviously your uh, algorithm will work good, it will give you good accuracy. And like I said, it basically depends on the training data. So we did this paper, which was published to the European Physical Journal, which is we applied a technique which is called random forest. So what we did is that there is already a published data set, which is by these authors, Kat and Gordon, which was published in 2018. So they used the data release two and they uh, actually um, identified members in clusters okay we what we did is we used this as a training set the problem is that they did it only till 18th magnitude so we want to go deeper down uh, gaia gives us 20 or 21st magnitude so we are going deeper down in um, in our data set and using this technique which is called random forest now, uh, uh, just for the benefit of the students, I would tell them that uh, basically when we are using uh, random forest, all these machine learning techniques, they are basically available in the SciPy package of uh, Python. Okay, so Python has a SciPy package in which there are these various uh, there's statistics also, and there is also which is very useful, and there's also the package for uh, member for machine learning. So random forest, we use the one. Uh, available in that that's the best one to do so for example in this uh, in these plots what you see the orange dots these these ones in the center these are the ones which were found by those earlier authors with that with their this thing which we used at the as the training set and the blue ones as the ones that we found actually they did it for a smaller radius also around the cluster not just membership uh, not just magnitude but also radius we looked in a larger radius because we know that clusters have a larger radius. They could have members outside, which you can clearly see that these guys' members are sitting only in the center because they took a smaller size of these clusters. We took double or triple their size to actually look for members in the outskirts. Okay, so in the outer regions of these clusters. So orange is theirs, blues is ours, and we actually found a larger number of members. If you can actually see how well our data satisfies theirs. The orange ones are, this is the histograms of the parallax. So you can see the orange ones are theirs. Blue are ours without theirs, excluding theirs. That's why you see it's slightly shifted. And green is the combined effect which we have now, which you can see satisfies the orange ones very well. So the orange ones was the earlier sample and the green is the combined sample, which kind of satisfies the same, this thing. So we can see that the parallax is also these are slightly shifted like because I told you the blue sample is the one which excludes theirs, excludes the training set. That's why it's slightly shifted. But the green one is the combined sample. So you can see that we actually increased our number of members, found the regions. Similarly, if, if you look at it in terms of velocities, this is proper motion, declination, proper motion and alpha. You can see that we also found substructures in velocity. This is in velocity space. This is not spatial coordinates. This is velocity space. And you can see in velocity space, uh, we already plotted ones where you see clumps where the members are there, for example, this. But here now when we add our members, we see that there are further clumps. There's further structure in velocity, which you can see in these plots, right? The original one has this, but when we add our members, we get the green one, which is the combined plot. So we got this and here you can see these are the updated uh, HR diagrams. So what's important is when we use the machine learning technique, we Gaia also gives us the G band magnitudes as well as the GBP and the GRP. 
those ones are also there. But uh, since they are not used in the machine learning technique, you can see we get these out these outliers. These are outliers in the sense they are not sitting on the HR diagram. They are sitting outside the HR diagram, but they are members. So for example, this cluster, which you see, this is 1893. This is a young cluster, or which one is it? I don't know. It's a young cluster. So you can clearly see these are pre-main sequence stars. These are young stars, hence they are sitting over here. And you can see that these extra stars which we are getting, they are all um, uh, additional members which were not there by the earlier this thing. Uh, so if you see in brief what we got with random forest is, you can see over here, if you take the ratio of our members to the members found by the early authors, it like lies between, it's about double three times, two, three times, we increase the number of members compared to the ones uh, found over there. Now it's an interesting thing, how do you calculate precision in such a method? Right? How do you find out precision? So precision is done in a very simple method in uh, supervised learning using what is called the 3070. You can keep a different. So what happens is, supposing I, uh, I of my training sample, I use only 70% of the data for training the sample. Okay, and then I keep 30% aside, and then when I run my code, I see how much of that 30% do I identify with my system, right? And how many I identify, that gives me my precision, right? I'll repeat it. So for example, if you have 100 images of dogs, you only supply 70 of them for training, okay? And then you run your random forest and you check whether the other 30, which you knew were dogs, are they identified or no? So that is one way of measuring the precision and that's what we did. So you can see over here, the precision is, something 85, 95, you know, the precision, you can assess how well uh, you've done the job of uh, precisely um, uh, identifying uh, members, right? So this is the advantage of doing it with supervised methods, which is the random forest one. So this was the results, we, we got published and done. Now what happened is the other next question is that, what about, like I said, the biggest problem about supervised method is you need to be sure about your training set, right? You need to sure, be sure that those 100 pictures you gave of dogs are really dogs, right? So we also tried out the unsupervised method. Supposing I do not trust those authors who had published membership data, let us try unsupervised methods and we try that to actually see whether that works better. So there are various clustering. So we used what were called, now if, mem uh, if stars belong to a cluster, right? If I, not the spatial distribution, but the parameter space, the parameter space, which is parallax, which is proper motion in RA, proper motion in deck, right? In that parameter space, members of a cluster should sit together, okay? This is not spatial, it's parameter space. So we, there are different ways of looking for clustering, looking for grouping of these. And what we did is we used, very, we used some clustering algorithms. For example, we used clustering algorithm Gaussian mixture modeling, as well as another algorithm called dbscan. I'll just tell you what each of them and we basically check whether it works for what is the distance. So let's see the principle of Gaussian mixture modeling. Supposing you have a sample, the green thing is a sample, okay? And I say that the sample is basically made up of Gaussians, which are, for example, this one, cluster one, two, three. So I, the whole sample, I break it up into Gaussians and I find out the, the centroids of these Gaussians as well as their standard deviations, etc. So we use this Gaussian mixture modeling. So you provide your data and you look for Gaussians. And based on the Gaussian, look at this. This is very beautiful. This is for M67. Uh, when we apply Gaussian mixture modeling, uh, you actually get two groups, two Gaussians. So you see, this is one Gaussian which has a very small standard deviation, right? Which is centered around a certain region, which is this. You get a second Gaussian, which is much broader, right? and it, it is not exactly centered. So what happens is these I can identify to be cluster members because cluster members will be at a certain parallax value. See, this is the parallax. So they're gonna be centered around a certain parallax value with a, with a uh, narrow standard deviation, not so broad, while these are the field stars. The field stars are randomly distributed, right? And therefore their Gaussian has a larger standard deviation. And uh, therefore, you can see that if these stars, I plot them, this is on parallax, this is in proper motion and RA. And here you can see, this is, if I had plotted all the stars on the HR diagram, you get this. 
but when you run gaussian mixture modeling only for the members you get this this is a very well known cluster called m67 and you can see that in this these stars these are very much members you may think that this doesn't sit on the hr diagram but these are very much members of the cluster these are called blue straggler stars so blue straggler stars are very interesting because they are see as per your normal logic stars of this mass have finished their hydrogen and helium they've moved rightwards towards the towards the red giant branch and this is the turn off of the cluster so the question is how can these stars be members when they have not yet turned off okay and these are therefore they, these are called blue stragglers which are uh, there are many theories of their origin one of the most popular theories is that they are formed by the merger of two stars so you merge two stars that's why they become brighter they become brighter hence they come up here and they are hotter if you remember in hr diagram this is hot this is cold this is bright this is faint so these stars are basically brighter and they are hotter because they are formed by the merger of stars and therefore these are blue stragglers which you can very nicely identify using this method while if you look over here if you were seeing this hr diagram it would be very confusing you will not identify these blue stragglers this is an old cluster so these are blue stragglers this one also shows what is called the binary sequence the binary stars are generally at a uh, a parallel line away from the main sequence stars so this uh, this is the sub ah, this is not in preparation this is submitted we have submitted it we are waiting for the referee report we've done it for nine clusters and we have this thing okay now in this uh, paper one interesting thing we did is that um, sorry i will go back so uh, what happens in gaussian mixture modeling what the problem is we don't have a supervised we do, it's not supervised so the problem is how do you assess how well it does it okay so generally for gaussian mixture modeling the method used is this this is what it is called silhouette score and silhouette score where b is the distance between groups and a is the distance within a group okay so if we separated groups nicely then b minus a b is going to be very large because b is the distance between groups right and a is the distance within a cluster divided by max ab so typically your silhouette score should be one because b is very large and maximum of ab is also b so you'll get it very large so s should be close to one but the problem is here when we look at uh, uh, star clusters you look at this space this is the velocity space you can see that the cluster stars are mixed with the field stars right while by gaussian mixture you would expect your stars to be in separate groups but this is not how they are right you see this in velocity space also it's sitting inside this and therefore we defined in this paper we defined a new score which we call the modified silhouette score we basically used what i told you about the standard deviations you see that the cluster stars have a smaller standard deviation than the field stars and therefore we our silhouette score is defined by the standard deviation of the field stars divided by the standard deviation of the members divided by the maximum between these two so ideally it should be equal to 1 where the field stars have a much larger standard deviation than the standard deviation for the members so we define this modified silhouette score uh, to validate validate our members for the same stars we also have spectroscopic data okay there are two surveys one is called apogee apogee is done with the sloan digital sky survey for the northern hemisphere and gala is done in australia which is basically for the southern hemisphere so in our galaxy in our cluster sample some of them are in the north some are in the south so we used um, their data this is all apogee so basically if the stars formed from the same cluster right they should have the same chemical composition right so over here you look at this uh, cluster 2682 the same m67 this is the chemical composition derived from those that supervised model which we used in the previous paper this is the chemical composition of the members which were given by those authors okay and now these are the chemical composition of the members which we identified using gaussian mixture modeling so this is basically a way of just validating because this is called chemical tagging right so if the stars form together they should have similar chemistry right so their spectroscopic data should also agree uh, these ones 
if you remember in the stats you were showed uh, box plots these are what are called violin plots by violin plots what do you mean this part is uh, this is uh, the the distribution of this quantity so if you have these large lines coming up this is showing you a large deviation but because it's thin it just basically means that you have very few stars which are you know in this region the bulk of the stars are all sitting here so this is for one cluster m67 2682 which is for the supervised sample and our sample and this is for yet another cluster another one which is 751 or some 752 so this is with the supervised model and this is with us so you can see that very well the chemical composition of the stars identified by those authors and by us is simple is similar so we used both these things to validate our sample one is our modified silhouette score and the other one is the spectroscopic data we use that we also used another software which is called azteca azteca is a software which basically can it's a code to basically identify members of a cluster to get their parameters all the parameters are given over here so we with our revised membership sample we actually found out the parameters for uh, this this 2682 is m67 it's the same uh, cluster and we basically used it to find out the values of the parameters for this cluster so that's what we did for gaussian mixture modeling we submitted this paper we hope for uh, decent reviews let's hope and uh, so this one is already submitted um, to add on to this actually by the way i should mention this right in the beginning this is all the content of the phd thesis of one of my students who our students rather who we just submitted the thesis on october 6th we've just submitted the thesis so all this is his thesis work basically done in his thesis now uh, we are applied another uh, method for um, unsupervised method which is called db scan again now what does db scan do supposing i have uh, i'll go here so this animation will start you see these are a group of points i want to find clusters I define epsilon, which is a radius, and I define minimum points. So within this epsilon radius, I look for, do you have four stars? If you have four stars, I can call it a cluster. Now, all these stars become part of a cluster because they are within epsilon radius with minimum points. Now, I check for these stars. These stars are members of the clusters, but they do not have four points within epsilon. And therefore, they are, these are called cluster points. These are called border points. Now, I'm checking for this one. This guy I draw epsilon radius, but I don't have four points inside it. And therefore, this is what I call a noise point. I don't count this as a cluster. This is also counted as a noise point because it does not have four stars within its epsilon radius. This star, I check, it's again, it does not have four stars within epsilon radius, but there are some stars in this which do have four stars in their epsilon radius. For example, this star. So this one I call a cluster star, right? So these are all uh, cluster stars. These are all these, but these are uh, these all get identified as cluster stars. So to identify clusters, it is basically around me. I draw a radius of epsilon and I count whether I have minimum number of points, for example, four points. And I say that. So, for example, if I have this point, right, look at this one. This one, I have four points within epsilon radius if this is minimum points. So this is a cluster point. But for example, this noise point does not have four stars within its um, epsilon radius. So this is not a cluster, but the, this, this is a cluster, this is a cluster. These two are not clusters, okay? So uh, based on this, DB scan can conclude here that you have two clusters, that is this cluster and this cluster, okay? So this is how we identify clusters using this DB scan, which basically stands for density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise. So uh, this was the paper, we, uh, this thing, this is with another student, and, uh, but part of the same thesis. So what we did is we ran DB scan for various uh, clusters. And we, um, this hopefully we should submit this very soon because we were busy submitting the thesis. This paper has to be submitted very soon. We'll do this. One part of the paper is already published, but the whole big one has to be done. So this one is again the same thing where we ran it. And again, this is the same cluster M67, which is NGC 2682. These are the old members, which are in orange. The green ones are our new ones. So if you look at the HR diagram, this is only till 18th magnitude. And what we've done with our stuff is we've got it down to two more magnitudes. Plus, 
we have studied the outer regions of the cluster, which were not studied by the, those authors. Those authors only studied the central region. We are trying to study the outer regions of these clusters. Again, we compared our data with Apogee Gala data. This is for M67 for our members. So we actually, you can see that the chemical composition of uh, those, the supervised sample and the, the sample that we have got is almost identical. We have very well got our members with the same chemical composition. And uh, like we did in that case, again, we ran Azteca to again get the revised uh, parameters for the, uh, the cluster. Okay. So the results we have, we re uh, found out the parameters for those clusters using the new membership data, which we got. Oh. You're all getting tired, but there's one more thing which we did. So that was all part of the thesis. This is lesser part of the thesis, but it's there in the thesis also. Uh, we also applied, this is another example of, so we did that for all those clusters. Here we also applied this for looking for young stellar objects. Okay, so serpents is a star forming region. You have this, this is the serpents region, star forming region. So what we did in this was something slightly different. What we did is, we find the YSOs are the young stellar objects, okay? Now to look for the young stellar objects, you basically have to look in X-ray, in infrared, in different uh, uh, wavelengths. So what we did is we identified the YSOs in this area using different samples. And then we, uh, you can see them over here. The, we then looked for the Gaia counterparts of these objects. Now, obviously, all of these are not found by Gaia because these are basically X-ray objects and infrared. And Gaia is basically looking in optical. But what we did, this is our modus operandi, which I will explain over here. We first do the YSO sample from different um, data sets. We cross-matched with Gaia. This was this paper was published when, um, when we had the early data release of Gaia. So this is EDR3 data. That time we did not have DR3 data, we had EDR3 data. So we matched it with EDR3 data and we got only 87 stars and we used that to get the parameters, okay, for the, the, the stars. And uh, so that was our control sample in two degrees. This is a very large region. See, we were doing clusters with like 30 arc minutes. This is two degrees, it's a much larger region. And for this larger region, we actually uh, made a control sample and then we used, we had only 87 stars. Then we used machine learning techniques. There's something called, there's DB scan. There's also something called optics and HDB scan. And using that, we found a whole more set of members from Gaia. And uh, using that, we could see the, the velocities of these objects, as well as we matched it with Tumas and WISE data so that we could identify the young stellar objects. So like I told you, you query your area of this. Uh, based on the Gaia sample, we got 1196 stars, we know their radial velocities, so we use their XYZ coordinates and their proper motion RA proper motion deck. And using this, we got a sample, we started off with 87 and now we got a sample of 822 young stellar objects in this region. This was also published in a paper in, okay, this got published last year. And uh, this is what I wanted to show Godson was this is this is the WISE data with two mass, two mass K band. So if you have WISE data and you have two mass K band data, which you will have for everything because WISE and two mass are all sky surveys. So they are all sky surveys. And basically with these, you can get the classes of the young stellar objects. For example, the class two objects are these ones in green. Class three objects are, I hope you know why so when you start off the youngest stars are class zero, class one, then it goes to class two and class three. So these are the class two objects. These are the class three objects. And these ones are the, um, uh, the, the youngest ones. So what we've done is we've plotted it over here. This is the serpents region. And we've actually plotted and shown you where do we have the class two and the class three objects and these uh, class one objects, right? So the, the photospheres are the red rhombuses. So we actually got that. And um, so that's it. So these are our various exercises which we did in machine learning. So I'll conclude with this. Um, and uh, basically it shows you that um, uh, the issues are, what are they, obviously you need to be careful about what are the algorithms you use. 
because all of them have their own special uh, advantages and disadvantages. The other thing is, for example, your training set. How big should your training set be? How do you validate your training set? Uh, check up, like I told you, when you're using supervised techniques, it very strongly depends upon how good your training set is. So you need to do that. And you also, important thing is to um, validate your membership. How do, or whatever you did, how do you validate the results of machine learning? Because still a lot of old timers who are uh, old timers kind of suspect machine learning that because that actually that's true in machine learning if you use a technique without understanding what the technique is doing you can actually just get nonsense okay because the the code will run everything will happen but if you don't understand what the technique is doing it may give you nonsense so you have to validate it for example like i showed you in random forest we did it by that 70 30 right but if you're using an unsupervised method for example i showed you through spectroscopic data or through the CMD. In the CMD, you can see that the members you have are, you know, sitting on the HR diagram, they are members, or you check the chemical composition, right? So you have to use some additional methods to validate your results of machine learning so that you can be confident about what you get in machine learning, because uh, this is a, uh, not exactly a dangerous tool, but it's a powerful tool. And if it is misused, it uh, can give you wrong results. So you need to be very careful what the results which you get in machine learning because there is a potential of getting wrong results, right? So I'll end with that and thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Priya, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we'll open it up to the floor for questions. Yeah. Contributions. Yeah, questions, comments. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ratan, for the precision uh, measurements. Yeah. I wanted to attend for why you are showing the precision, combination of precision. You want that 70 30? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You want. Yeah. Yes. Um, I am under the column for precision. I see we are, we are 99. Uh, yeah, you, you, this is the one, right? Yes. Oh, sorry, uh, man. So yeah, yeah. That, that, that seems to be quite um, precise, like 99%. Yeah. Uh, and of course, most of the results are within yeah, quite a good uh, procedure. Uh, so, um, what could be the factors that could have given us that high procedure of 99% uh, as compared to the other? Slightly off values. Uh, Which were the slightly off values? Uh, if you if you look at, for example, eighty six. Okay, if you compare eighty six to ninety nine, ninety nine is almost. Ah, uh, okay. You say what are the factors which could have changed it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, that is yeah. I I so obviously one thing it depends upon the training set. How good is the training set? And uh, the training set will vary for different clusters, depending upon where is the cluster lying, uh, in which part. In all these procedures, a very important thing is how many field stars do you have in that area? Because uh, the machine learning technique has to pick up cluster members from the field stars, right? So that could be a very, that could be an important factor, the amount of field star contamination. Like for Gaussian mixture modeling, we know that a very important factor is field star contamination. If you have too many field stars and you want to get out two Gaussians from it, then it does not come out if the field stars are too much. So you have to ensure when you're running Gaussian mixture modeling that you have lesser number of field stars. So what we actually did in our code is that we uh, picked up stars which had values closer to the values for the cluster, because otherwise you'll end up with too many field stars and the, the, the Gaussian for the members will be drowned in the Gaussian for the field stars. The Gaussian for the field stars will be like this and the members will be somewhere stuck inside. It won't come out. So I think in this case, most probably the factor should be the, um, the, the field star contamination. And then you can also see, okay, but this one, it's 1.81 for 86, but you have 1.76 for 94. So it's not true that you get more members, it's this is more. No, that's not true. 
So uh, I think maybe feedstock contamination, something like that. Yeah, uh, we took clusters of different ages, yeah, different location in the galactic region, so that to understand whether the model is running well with the old clusters. If we always they would have dynamically uh, stabilized and you know very realized, and assume the Gaussian distribution or not. So we tried different ages, different locations, and so on. Mm -hmm. And we didn't see any correlation accuracy of that being good for ages and so on. But like Priya said, the fields that the contamination played a big role in growth. Yeah. yeah, maybe the last one. Uh, on, in your final uh, comment uh, with regards to uh, the use of machine learning, and you gave some precautions that one has to, yeah. uh, to be careful. Yeah, so um, I just want you to read that side again. So, what would you say? Um, Basically, uh, the advantages of machine learning uh, in, uh, in, uh, in your study uh, as compared to other methods uh, and also paying attention to uh, what we want us to be. Uh, because one can get, use machine learning, get your result, but yeah. how, do you, how sure are you that yeah, my results are correct. correct? That's right. So that's what I'm saying. So many people use machine learning algorithms like black boxes. Right? You feed in something, you get a result, and you think that's a result. Uh, but that's why I'm saying that number one is you should understand the algorithm well. And number two, the results. If you have some other way of validating, like we have used spectroscopic data, right? We are saying that the chemical composition of these stars is the same. So they could and should have formed from the same cluster, right? So when we are doing this, for, for example, we are basically showing that, um, yeah, the chemical composition, this is for the supervised set, and this is for the one that we got. So we are trying to show that the chemical composition seems to be same. So I'm saying that you also have to put importance on how do you validate? How do you show that the result which you got from machine learning is correct, right? So that is very important. So we have done different things like that silhouette, modified silhouette score, We've done it with uh, chemical composition. We are doing it with the CMD. You can see that they sit nicely on the color magnitude diagram. So those additional things also have to be done to validate. Um, uh, if I, uh, yeah, so I, I think that all those things have to be done because uh, typically if you try to submit these papers, the referee's biggest question will be, how do I know that what you did is correct? Right, because uh, especially older people, they are very suspicious of machine learning. So when you do some machine learning thing, they say, ah, I know, I know, you are just run some Python package and you all got some result. And uh, they, you know, they may suspect whether it is. Suspect. Yeah. So all those things, what I'm saying, all those things, you have to be able to validate your result using some method. Uh, that is what is very important. Because otherwise, uh, <clears throat> you get, you put in something, you will get a result. But uh, you don't know whether it's right or wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think I'll look what's last. Oh, yeah, my question is slightly on technical side. Uh, so when uh, these, these data actually uh, analysis is performed on the images, right? Yeah. And when you're doing... Uh, no, not on the images. Mm -hmm. We are doing it on the Gaia catalogs, not mm -hmm. the images. Okay. But that data, catalog data, what does it contain? What information does it have? So it has the right ascension, declination, parallax, proper motion RA, proper motion oh, deck. Okay. This is okay. the data which is coming from Gaia. Okay, then that, that's not. Okay. No, then it has. All right, so, um, uh, so I saw you use random forests yeah. to do the classifications. I, you've been talking about different variables which you've taken. Mm -hmm. Do you think the neural networks will do a better job than the unknown forest? Definitely. So actually with my next student who is who will submit by next year, we are doing neural networks. Yeah. But but that's what I'm saying. All these techniques have different uh, powers in them. So what we basically did in this thesis was we were trying to compare the different methods to see which one do we find uh, useful. So what we are doing is we are providing all the um, the the on through GitHub, we are providing all the Python notebooks. So if you want to apply it to any other cluster, you can apply it. 
so yes neural networks is our is our next thing which we are already working on yes so that is uh, so if the problems uh, around neural networks do you think it would be nice to have say an unsupervised model to mm -hmm. reduce some dimensions okay then you use that data to feed into say random forest or neural networks yeah so yeah be... that's right so actually what we have done is uh, we did not use um, we, we ourselves uh, argued which are the parameters we want to feed in for the machine learning. But yes, we can do something. That that would be a good idea. We can, uh, but, but we have ourselves. Uh, okay. We, we didn't use any uh, algorithm for that. The final one is, say you you're doing all these uh, algorithms, and I saw you had uh, outliers, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. a few times. So do you think incorporating something like uh, statistics, mm -hmm. the descriptive statistics, yeah. to understand the outliers much better? Exactly, okay. yeah. I, that's the next step which we need to do. Okay. Yes. What we did is like we did it just for parameters and all that, but a more detailed study of the, okay. the results, yes, is a very good idea to do. We should do that. Yeah. That, thanks, that's a very good question. Yeah, my question is on these uh, softwares and applications like the Aste, Asteca, CA, and yeah. the DB scan. And you have already mentioned that random forest is one of the machine learning tools which you use yeah. as compared to the neural network, which I'm already familiar with. Mm -hmm. These uh, Aztec, CA, and the DB scan, we are, are they softwares or are they procedures which are already established for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Australia? Or will you develop them yourself? No, 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 no. They are already available software, which is there, and we downloaded that. Yes. Okay. So DB scan and all that is all part of the scikit learn package, which is there on Python. So there, there is that. There's even there's an AstroPy ML, which is also there. So there's lots of machine learning on Python available. So that's the big advantage of Python that the code is already there, but you have to adapt it for your use. Okay. But it's there. Okay, then the final question, the graphs that you plot, you look very extremely good. With, they, These are all they, Python. They are, they are all Python, Python yeah, graphs. Yeah, they are all Python graphs. Not see, top cap. See, if you want, those are what are called, see, these are called violin plots. This is all Python. But you, I mean, I can give you the code, I can show you the code. I would like to plot those graphs. Like the Actually, if you just Google, you'll say violin plot Python, you will get it. We did, I did box plot. Yeah. The next step was to do the violin plots. Oh, okay. But you are too tired to. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me. I understand the box plot now. Uh, it's okay, but the box yeah. plot. This other one was a uh, Python model so called violin. Violence also gives the variance. That it, how yeah. was the variance at each thing? What is it called again? Violin. Violin.